After five years of waiting, the next generation of MacBook Pros are finally here, and I managed to find not five, not ten, but 30 interesting things you probably didn't know about them and that you should definitely know before buying. Starting off at number 30, we now have the exact same configuration options on both the 14-inch and the 16-inch. So they have the same components, and the only differences are the display size and the battery life, which is awesome because if you wanted to get the most powerful MacBook, you no longer have to get the 16-inch model to have that performance. Number 29, there are a ton of configuration options now, the most we've ever had in a MacBook. So there are two CPU options, an 8-core and a 10-core. There are four GPU options, a 14-core, 16-core, 24, and 32. There are three RAM options, 16, 32, and 64. And in terms of storage, you can get from 512 all the way up to 8 terabytes. The only difference between the 14 and the 16-inch here is that the 14-inch is the only one that can come with the 8-core CPU and the 14-core GPU. The 16-inch starts from the 10-core CPU and the 16-core GPU. This video is sponsored by Clean My Mac X. So for the past week, my M1 MacBook Pro has been dreadfully slow, likely because I had a ton of third-party apps, which were taking up almost the entirety of my RAM and storage space. But with Clean My Mac X, I was able to just press a button and instantly clear out app caches, run maintenance scripts, repair disk permissions, and even disable apps that would automatically launch when my Mac booted, all to speed up my system. Try Clean My Mac X for yourselves by using the link below. At 28, the battery life is actually worse than on the M1. So the M1 offered 17 hours of web browsing, 20 hours of video playback. Uh, the 14-inch offers 11 hours of web browsing and 17 hours of video playback, so quite a bit worse. Uh, the 16-inch offers 14 hours of web browsing and 21 hours of video playback. That's because the CPUs are more power hungry, so the M1 is still the champ in terms of the overall battery life. But something really cool here is that at 27, we also have faster charging. 50% in 30 minutes, but you can only do that if you have the new 96 watt power adapter. So at 26, we actually have three different power adapters. There's the 67 watt, which you can only get if you buy the baseline 14 inch model. Uh, then there's the 96 watts, for which you have to pay $20 extra to get it, or you can get it for free with a 10 core CPU model of the 14 inch model. And then there's also the 140 watt power adapter, which is the most powerful and it's pretty huge, and that's exclusive to the 16 inch model. Then at 25, we have two methods of charging these MacBook Pros. We have USB Type-C, which is the old one, and we also have MagSafe with MagSafe 3, which is the one that supports faster charging, and this is the magnetic uh, version of the charger, which disconnects automatically when you trip on it, so MagSafe is finally back. Then at 24, the cable is removable from the power adapter, which uh, is not anything new, but in terms of MagSafe, it is new. So this is the very first removable MagSafe from the power brick. And that's great for traveling because you can still use that brick to charge other USB-C devices if you use a USB Type-C to USB Type-C cable. Then at 23, we do have a weight increase. So the 14 inch is now 200 grams heavier than the old 13 inch. Uh, and the 16 inch is 100 grams heavier than the old 16 inch. However, if you get the M1 Max uh, SOC version of the 16 inch model, that will be 200 grams heavier than the old 16 inch. Then at 22, you probably noticed that these MacBooks look super thick, but in reality, did you guys know that they're actually thinner than the old models, or at least the 14-inch model is, which is thinner by 0.1 millimeters, whereas the 16-inch model is indeed thicker, but only by 0.6 millimeters. The reason why they look so thick is because Apple is no longer trying to make them look thin, like they did with the previous models, where they had that bulge, uh, which gave you the illusion that they were super thin, but in reality, they were actually thicker, at least the 13-inch was, than this new 14-inch. Then at 21, we do have some port limitations. So you're all probably aware of the new ports, MagSafe, HDMI, SD card reader, and the three Thunderbolt 4 ports, but the HDMI is only HDMI 2.0, which means that it only supports up to a maximum of 4K 60 Hz. It doesn't support 4K 120. You can do that if you use the Thunderbolt ports. And then when it comes to the SD card slot, there is no mention of this being UHS 2 or UHS 3. So this is likely the old UHS 1 standard. Then at number 20, let's talk about external display support. So the M1 only supported one external monitor. Uh, the M1 Pro chip, both the 14 and the 16 inch, uh, they support two external displays. And then if you get the M1 Max chip, that one supports four external displays, three 6K and one 4K. So the issue with not supporting enough displays is finally fixed with his new chips. Then number 19, let's talk about the notch, more specifically about when the notch is visible and when it is not. So it is visible when the menu bar is also visible, so in windowed apps. 
the menu bar is now taller to match the height of the notch and the notch only cuts into the menu bar. And it is not visible when the menu bar is hidden, so in full screen apps. And interesting enough, the apps will still have a 16 by 10 aspect ratio, so they actually won't take up any upper portion of the display. So the display size in that case will be very similar to what we had on the old MacBook Pros. Number 18, the display brightness has been significantly increased. So on the previous MacBook Pros, we had up to 500 nits. On these new ones, we have 1000 nits, so essentially double but it can also go up to 1600 nits peak brightness in HDR. So when you're watching a movie, a few areas of the screen will be able to go that bright, which is insane coming from the 500 nits that we have now. Then at number 17, the displays are also sharper. So the resolutions have been increased on both the 13 inch and the 16 inch to something that's very close to 4K now. So we have almost 3.5K on the 16 inch model. And the PPI is also higher now. So we have 254 versus 227 and 226 like we had before. And then the black levels have also been significantly improved thanks to mini LED technology. So we now have 10,000 mini LEDs inside the backlight of these MacBook Pros, which allow us to have multiple dimming zones, just like on the new M1 iPad Pro 12.9 inch. Now, glowing will be present just like on the iPad Pro, so if you were not a fan of that, unfortunately, it will be here too, but this is still an amazing improvement over the black levels of the old LCD panel. Of course, that OLED would have been better, but OLED cannot achieve the insane level of brightness that Mini LED is capable of at the moment. Not only that, but at number 15, we also have more colors. To be more specific, we now have a 10-bit panel, which is able to display over 1 billion colors compared to the previous 8-bit panel, which was able to display 16.7 million colors. Which means that the new displays can now display 64 times more colors. That's a massive improvement. And number 14, we have multiple refresh rates. So we have a pro motion display, which was something that I was not expecting, uh, which can display up to 120 hertz, but it can also go down to 24 hertz to save battery life. So everything will be super fluid and smooth when you're scrolling or even when you're gaming. But then you can also have fixed refresh rates that you can manually switch to. So we have 60, 59.94, 50, 48, and 47.95. And this is very useful for when you're editing video and you want your refresh rate to match the content's frame rate. Now, the front-facing camera has been improved. This is also one of the reasons why we have that notch. So it's 1080p in resolution. We have four element lens. Uh, we have an f2.0 aperture, which according to Apple results in a two times better low light performance. We will be testing that, of course. So make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss out the first impressions next week when we get the actual MacBook Pros in the studio. Then number 12, there is actually a brand new headphone jack that supports high impedance headphones. So essentially, if you buy one of those professional studio monitor headphones that normally require more power in order to sound best, then these new MacBook Pros will be able to deliver that. Then number 11, we now have even better speakers and even better microphones than before. So we have a six speaker system, which is louder and clearer and delivers 80% more bass. And we also have spatial audio with head tracking if you have AirPods. By the way, this doesn't work on the old Intel model. This is exclusive to the new ones uh, and the M1. And then the microphones have a 60% lower noise floor for clearer sound pickup. Now, let's talk about the actual CPU improvements at number 10. Uh, both the M1 Pro chip and the M1 Max are 30 watt packages. In Xcode, which is a very CPU intensive application, the 14 inch model with a 10 core CPU will be 3.7 times faster than the previous quad core Intel i7 13 inch, and the 16 inch will now be 2.1 times faster than the top of the line 8 core i9 16 inch model. Then at number 9, the GPU improvements are even more impressive. So the 14 inch model with a 16 core GPU is now 9.2 times faster at exporting a 4K project than the previous Intel Iris 13 inch model. And the 32 core GPU model is now 13.4 times faster. The 16 inch with a 16 core GPU is 1.7 times faster than the 5600M graphics at the maxed out Intel 16 inch model. And then the 13 core GPU model is now 2.9 times faster. What's interesting to note here is that the 5600M graphics was a $700 upgrade over the 5500M on the 16 inch model. So yeah, the GPU improvements are absolutely insane, but now you're all probably wondering, how do these new MacBook Pros compare against Windows laptops? Well, CPU wise, against an Intel 11800H, the M1 Max is 1.7 times faster 
and consumes 70% less power. Oh, and we'll be doing a very detailed performance test to test all of these claims, so definitely make sure that uh, you're following the channel to see that video as soon as it comes out. Now, GPU-wise, the 32-core M1 Max is actually very close in performance to an RTX 3080 inside a top-of-the-line laptop, but it actually consumes less than 60 watts of power compared to 165 watts. So I never <laughs> expected a MacBook Pro to be able to reach this level of graphical performance. Uh, literally, all we need now is AAA games. Speaking of games, at number seven, how do these new MacBook Pros compare against an actual console? Well, if we take a look at the memory bandwidth, the PS5 has 448 gigabytes per second, and the M1 Max has 400. So it's already approaching the bandwidth of the PS5. And now in terms of the actual raw GPU performance, the PS5 has 10.3 teraflops, while the M1 Max has 10.4. So you basically have a PS5 that's this thin and fits in your backpack. How amazing is that? Speaking of graphic performance, at number six we have the RAM and how it impacts the GPU performance. So RAM actually acts as video memory too, which means that the more RAM you have, the more video memory you will have, which means that if you get uh, the M1 Max with 64 gigabytes of RAM, you will have 64 gigabytes of video memory, which is insane in any computer, not just the laptop, but you're probably wondering if you have 64 gigabytes of video memory, will that mean that you have zero RAM left for the operating system? Well, not really. And that's because the storage speeds are now twice as fast uh, to up to 7.4 gigabytes per second. Previously, the super fast 3.2 gigabytes per second storage was actually used as swap memory for the CPU when there was not enough RAM available. Which means that now, with twice the speed, uh, the CPU will have even faster swap memory for when it needs it, which means that the GPU can actually use uh, that RAM as video memory more comfortable. So 64 gigabytes of video memory is actually theoretically doable now. Again, we'll have to test and see. And number four, we have a pretty big one, which is ProRes acceleration. So the M1 Pro chip can encode and decode ProRes and ProRes RAW footage. And not even the Mac Pro, by the way, with the Afterburner card is able to encode ProRes and ProRes RAW. Now the M1 Max actually has two ProRes encode and decode engines, as well as two H.265 and 264 engines, uh, rather than just one. So video exports and timeline playback, especially with ProRes and ProRes RAW, should be significantly more fluid and faster here. And number three, there is also a new cooling system that allows for 50% more airflow and also runs at lower fan speeds. So it's less quiet, but it cools the system better. And speaking of things that are better, did you guys know that with these new MacBook Pros, we get the same performance, plugged or unplugged? It doesn't matter if it's plugged in or not. With Windows laptops, you actually get lower performance if you're not plugged in. And at number one, you all know that the touch bar is gone, but did you guys know that we also get some touch bar controls on the actual keyboard, such as search, dictation, and do not disturb. We'll be getting the new MacBook Pros next week, so expect loads of videos and loads of testing with quite a few models. We bought like four or five MacBook Pros, so quite a few coming. So thanks for watching. Stay tuned for that video. I'm Daniel, this has been Tech, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Synoptech, signing out. Cheers.